Welcome back everybody, this is Eric and Chad here with IRAC Veteran 8888. Uh, today we've got another gun gripe episode for you. A ton of people have been asking us to talk about this ITAR stuff that's coming through and you know some form of uh, executive order and all this stuff that they're talking about. Um, I had a chat with the NRA about it, uh, talked with them over there and I've got some bullet points here we're going to kind of discuss about it. ITAR is nothing new, it's been around uh, for a while. Uh, it comes down to enforcement and interpretation um, of the law and what a lot of people don't realize about this ITAR stuff. What ITAR deals with in this particular instance, now ITAR covers a wide variety of different defense articles. I hate to use that word because uh, I just hate it. it it's, it's like assault weapon. I hate using the word assault weapon. Well, it's, but it's all in a legal term. It's yeah, a legal so. term, so it deal, deals in defense articles, but basically what this all comes down to, the director of the DDTC, which is basically the Directorate of Defense Trade Controls. Yeah, we have a cheat sheet here. So basically this guy put out an opinion letter, or basically published an opinion Guidance letter. letter. Guidance letter. That, that deals in what exactly the interpretation of this thing really is. And what a lot of people don't realize about this is most of this ITAR stuff that's coming down really came about because of people in the gun industry seeking clarification. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, you know, if you work in the gun industry, chances are you're a law-abiding person. You want to try to do the right thing. You want to make sure you're on the right side of the law. You want to make sure that your business is protected because you are doing the right thing. When it, you know, let's face it, it's a lot easier to deal with something when you just follow the regulations, follow the laws, and make sure you're doing your part to make sure that you're staying out of trouble. Well, that's why, like, you know, gun businesses, FFL holders, why not use services like FFL Guard to make sure that they are staying on top of any sort of new laws or regulations or interpretations or whatever needs to be done to make sure that they operate within the legal bounds of the law. You know, and, you know, very simple. You know, simple. But okay, so so where does the whole gripe concept come into play here? Why is this a problem? Why okay. is it an issue? So you, you saw a bunch of headlines uh, recently about, you know, ITAR in relation to gunsmiths and, you know, gunsmiths not being able to do things like attaching a scope to a rifle or threading a barrel without paying these exuberant fees that are, uh, you know, required by ITAR. It's $2,250, uh, I think. $2,250, I think, per year. Now, I got a lot of my information. I will, you know, say that we kind of cheat a little bit, but there's a very good program over on the Gun Collective called the Legal Brief. Yes. Legal Brief with Adam Kraut, and uh, they do a very good job. He is actually an attorney, and he breaks down these laws and all this mess, you know, in a very detailed fashion, sure. where you can understand it clearly. Which, you know, we're just dumb rednecks. I mean, we don't really. You know, we're giving the common man's view here. Okay? We're trying to give the layman's view, also, but also there's it's a just bunch crazy. of bullet points that I've uh, detailed here. <laughs> I'm going to be cheating off, and some of this stuff is actually from the uh, NRA's ILA mm -hmm. uh, article that is on this particular subject. So, but certainly go over there and check that out if you want more details on sure. this. But the the basic thing is number one, this was not an executive order for everybody out there who you know can't stand Obama. I mean, you know. It's not an executive order. Sorry, this was put out by the DDTC, not the White House. You can go to the White House page and you can look at the executive orders, and you're not going to find it. Okay, it's not there. Trust me, I look too just to be sure. But this this thing, like Eric said, the industry has been asking for clarification on this for years, and then the the letters put out there, and basically it's saying that if you gunsmith and you're you're in the business of manufacturing, which is defined by the Gun Control Act and by the ATF, not by uh, ITAR and not by the the uh, what is it called the Arms Export Control Act is the actual law that the DDTC oversees pertaining to ITAR. Right. I love so, alphabet. Exactly. I love alphabet agencies, alphabet and, agencies but and acronyms. To, to, to really dumb it down and make it really, really simplified in, in simple man's terms, the whole gripe here is that the, this whole ITAR regs is a little bit of a, of a confusion to commercial gunsmiths, particularly small commercial operations yes. gunsmithing, because it basically rolls up what they're doing into all this ITAR regs and basically it says right here, you know, the upshot is that the DDTC is labeling commercial gunsmiths as manufacturers mm -hmm. for performing relatively simple work such as threading a barrel or fabricating a small custom part for an older firearm. 
So you're not really changing the firearm, but the fact that you're making a part or the fact that you're maybe improving the performance by mm -hmm. drilling and tapping for a scope base, adding an optic. For instance, like the way we sporterize our Mosins and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to just do that for somebody without, you know, under this being a, a manufacturer. And of course, paying the, you know, expensive yearly ITAR fee. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it is a money thing. I think that it's a disenfranchisement. They, they want to try to disenfranchise smaller gun uh, smiths who may not be able to afford such a, a rate, you know. I just find it difficult <clears throat> to believe that, you know, the definition of manufacturing is including modifications to current firearms that are on the market. That's I mean, ambiguous that, as hell. It's just crazy. Like yeah. the Mosins, for example, I mean, I, I don't know how many Mosins... Nobody makes a new Mosin. Yeah, how many Mosins have been customized? Or uh, think about Segas. I mean, all the Sega conversions that y'all did, y'all had to drill and tap a few things on mm -hmm. the receiver of those firearms, so does that constitute manufacturing the firearm? You know, uh, it, under the under this guidance letter, it, it kind of does. Well, I mean, you know? there, there's some clarification that still needs to really be kind of, you know, defined uh, on what, what some of these terms really mean for somebody. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, think about an AR. Okay, if I buy an AR lower and then I assemble an AR, I buy all the parts online, have it shipped straight to my front door, and I assemble an AR in my basement at my, at my, my bench, I didn't manufacture anything. The manufacturer made the lower and sold it to a distributor who then sold it to a gun shop who then sold it to me. I didn't manufacture anything, but according to this... One thing that was noted in there, though, like the assembly of a rifle is not considered manufacturing. So, I mean, okay, so I've got a business of building ARs, okay, and I sell ARs. So, am I not in the business of manufacturing because I'm building AR-15s and I'm not really making any, you know, modifications to that it? I'm not drilling, us, drilling and tapping or threading muzzles or anything like that. We're just putting parts together. That leads I, us to our next bullet, bullet point. So, the DDTC generally labels procedures that involve cutting, drilling, or machining of an existing firearm in order to improve its accuracy or operation or to change its caliber as manufacturing, even if they do not create a new or dis distinct firearm. Where's that high point 10 millimeter at? Uh, I don't even, no, I don't go there. But, uh, you know, the thing is, it's like, this includes threading a muzzle for a muzzle device or blueprinting that requires machining of a barrel. So basically what they're saying is if I buy a factory Remington 700 and a, uh, let's say a buddy of mine brings me a Remington 700 and I charge him whatever amount of money to pull the barrel and like machine the, the face of the receiver and the rear of the barrel and then made everything up to get full contact and then like hand lap the, the locking lugs mm -hmm. and like hand finish chamber it and, mm -hmm. and, and really fit everything really well. I've essentially created a new gun at that point, yeah. according You've to them. You've manufactured a, a firearm right. and even... And I don't do that. But, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. even one instance is enough to be required to pay the fees to be under ITAR. Or, so, good example, let's say that, uh, oh. let's, say, let's say you're a local AR aficionado and you know your way around AR really well, and let's say you know how to build ARs and stuff like that, and say a buddy of you, a buddy of yours comes up to you with a box of parts and a strip lower that he put on a 4473, you know, he bought it or whatever, and he says, hey man, can you assemble this AR for me? Mm -hmm. Are you a manufacturer at that mm -hmm. point? If not, you put, if you assemble it for someone else and you're paid to do it, not, mm, not really. I mean, I mean not, but, not, but you're performing a gunsmithing operation. Yeah, you, but you're you not. Know, you yeah. can't just slap that stuff together. You still have to have a knowledge of. You yeah, know, but see, you're not you're not performing a procedure that involves cutting, drilling, or machining of an existing firearm or anything like that. It doesn't right. really assembling an AR doesn't fit into the category of manufacturing. It doesn't fit the definition of manufacturing. Okay, yeah. here, so. here, here's another one. I'll say, according to some sources, the appearance of a firearm being changed prior to sale could constitute the need of registering with ITAR as a manufacturer. So basically, Duracoat and Seracoat. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a gunsmith and a customer brings me in a rifle or something and they say, hey, I want you to Seracoat, uh, you know, pink elephants all over my gun or whatever, that's fine because they already own that gun and they brought it to me and I'm providing a service to apply a finish to a firearm. Mm -hmm. But they're almost, you know, and we actually had an examiner out at Malls the other day, and we were asking one of the uh, the examiners at the ATF, like, well, what if we buy a factory gun and we Cerakote it here and then offer it for sale as like a custom option on the floor for somebody to just walk in off the street and buy as a pre-customized gun? Well, at that point, you are a manufacturer because that person did not that. seek you out for it. You're changing the appearance of the gun prior to it leaving the store. It's so dumb and ambiguous, and there's still a lot of things that 
can kind of come out about this, which we'll, we'll hit on in a moment, of course, because you mentioned the, what is it, the new uh, House resolution? It said House Resolution 829 is one thing that I was reading about, yeah. is is kind of going through the line right now, and you know it's, it's meant to kind of clarify some of these things yeah. and remove, like, the ambiguous stuff that doesn't make sense. Well, not only that, but you think about ITAR in general. ITAR is <laughs> is regarding defense articles, okay? And you look at the, the United States munitions list, which is in ITAR, and it basically lists all these different things and items uh, that are you know prohibited from export or this, that, and the other, or are regulated under ITAR and all that. And it's everything from normal, everyday firearms to, to nuclear, nuclear technology, technology, missiles, missiles uh, yeah. submarines, war vessels, yeah. uh, stuff fighter that, planes. Stuff that 99.9% I mean, of the population doesn't have access to anyway. Explosives, rocket launchers, explosive ordnance. I mean, all kinds of crap. Right. It's They're just trying silly. to dole all, you know, Joe Blow America in with that stuff. So, uh, again, I'm going to go down another bullet point here. Basically, it's kind of along the same thing, but it says that... Yeah, I'm trying to find some... Gunsmithing includes only very simple procedures, such as one-for-one uh, uh, -one drop-in replacement parts that do not require cutting, drilling, or machining for installation. But even then, if the parts improve the accuracy, caliber, or other aspects of the firearms operation, manufacturing may occur. Okay, so, so dropping, basically, a, uh, dropping a Geisley trigger into an AR. That that could enhance the accuracy, or dropping a yeah. brainy barrel into a an AR. Yeah, I mean, replacing like, a barrel, a barrel swab. So, or so does that enhance the accuracy? Or a guy brings me a Mosin Sporter that he built himself. He did everything on it. He cut the barrel. He recrowned it. He threaded it. He drilled and tapped it himself. But say he's not good with stock work and he needs me to bed the stock. Well. By that letter or by that opinion, you could uh, you reasonably assume that betting the stock. Embedding the action of a rifle would improve the accuracy. So what, if you bet a stock for somebody, you're now a manufacturer? It's just crazy. I mean, it, this stuff came out, and I was literally, I was watching the uh, the legal brief last night just to garner a little bit more information about this, and uh, I was just surprised. My jaw just dropped. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. This yep. crap is, is the real deal? Like, are you really saying that if a gunsmith drills and taps a receiver, then he needs to pay $2,250 a year to be under ITAR and to be within the legal limits of the law. Otherwise, he could be subject to, it's like Ray, okay, so if Ray does that, he could be subject to penalties up to like a million dollars or jail time. I mean, like, really? Yeah. I don't know, man. It's just I, I think insane. It's, it's kind of lame that they, that they dole all of this up into the same general area as like nuclear submarine technology. I mean, if I drill and tap a, a hundred-year-old Mauser rifle for a, for an optic or something, I, I'm not really doing anything that hasn't been done hundreds of thousands of times by people for years and years and years. I mean, it's not like you're, you're talking like Death Star plans or anything. You know what I mean? Like it's it's not like quite that crazy. Okay. I mean, I think that maybe if this House resolution that 829, if if that, you know, turns into something and creates some steam mm -hmm. and provides a means to clarify some of these definitions and hopefully kind of separate, um, you know, the, the, the true, true, sure enough, like, hey, we need to protect this technology from the, hey, you know, this is commonly available technology. I mean, what person can't buy a drill and tap kit and drill their own holes and, 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 and tap their own holes? And another thing that I want to mention about this ITAR, I mean, mm -hmm. so if if I'm a YouTuber and I make a video that shows you how to fully disassemble a Glock and put it back together, or let's just let's go a little bit further and let's say that we teach you how to drill and tap holes, cut down barrels and recrown them, uh, you know, thread muzzles, you know, maybe if we did a video on basic mill and lathe work as it involves gunsmithing. Mm -hmm. Does that then mean that, you know, because I'm sharing knowledge at that point, so I, I'm not physically doing it for you, but I may teach you how to do it yourself. And so far, knock on wood, there's nothing in any of this crap that dictates um, how you may or may not be able to do perform a task on your own. It doesn't mean you can't go in your basement and run a Dillon 1050 and reload 10,000 rounds a day if you want. That's your prerogative. It doesn't mean that you can't you know, call up whatever um, a place that makes custom barrels or mm -hmm. something and order you a nice custom barrel for your AR and maybe you're enterprising enough and knowledgeable enough to just swap it yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think where it really becomes this, this fiat it is the fact that it, when you start charging people for your services, again, a lot of the stuff is intent. 
It's just like the whole drone crap, you know, like registering drones and the intention. I think intention. they threw that out now. They threw so. it out, but the thing is, you know, th this whole like drone registration or the intent of it. So what they're saying is if your intent is to be a professional gunsmith and to perform services for people for the exchange of money, you are providing a service, at that, be at that point when it becomes a service, then that falls under this just mm -hmm. gluttony here of, of random regulation. So that's really the best way to look at it. Yeah, if you're doing it on your own and you're just you're a guy at home doing his thing, then it doesn't apply to you because you're yeah. not a manufacturer. You're not providing a service for somebody. Yeah, there's a link on um, or there's a uh, an article here from uh, Daily Caller talking about the NSSF and whatnot. And this says, uh, this has got a good comparison here. Um, it says that, unfortunately, the DDTC's guidance has created considerable and uh, understandable confusion and concern among uh, gunsmiths and gun owners. Um, they're reviewing the guidance letter and whatnot, and uh, you know, it's talking about House Resolution 829 still, and I'm not sure if that's right, but we'll clarify that for you. Sure. But it says, the term, the term manufacturer as used in the AECA and ITAR is its ordinary dic uh, dictionary definition. Clearly, many of the activities DDCC claims require registration constitutes gunsmithing and is not manufacturing under any reasonable definition of the term. Yep. Uh, it says the DDTC's position is similar to claiming that an auto mechanic who fixes your car is also an auto manufacturer. It's kind of the same thing. So here's another good way to look at it. Let's rewind for a moment. So say you're a gunsmith and you're thinking, holy crap, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to to do this ITAR stuff and all. Well, you might as well go on and just be a class 10 or a class 7 or oh, yeah. you know, just go on and pony up for that. You know, it's like $3,000 every three years to be a class 10. So go on and fork out the three grand, get your class 10, make you a bunch of... Uh, Make you a bunch of machine guns to maintain on your, you know, on your your store registry. You can take out and go out and play with, and you really will be manufacturing. So. Yeah, because because uh, <laughs> a class, and then you know, of course, if you're a ten, you have to be ITAR certified. Yeah, I and think all that too. class seven and above has to be a ten, from what I understood. Uh, you know, just a regular FFL or an SOT or whatever, like or gunsmithing FFL. They're sure. not required to register under ITAR, at least. Not as of now, but yeah. that could change. I mean, given this guidance letter and everything, but yeah. it's it's very confusing. But you know, just the it it, it kind of sucks. You know, it's, I wish we could report better news about yeah. it. But I mean, just the looking at the the cover, pretty much. Yep, it just looks bad. All right. Know? So before we let you go, we'll we'll leave you with one thought when it comes to this kind of thing. Is uh, you know, looking at ITAR and all this kind of bullcrap that's going on. Enforcement. It it, it is an enforcement <laughs> thing, guys. I mean, how are they going to enforce it? For one, but then two, the underlying the underlying sort of <sighs> reasoning for all this. Money. Dollars. They just want your dang money. <laughs> That's all it is. It's just like any other government <sighs> thing where some guy comes out and says, Oh, well, you got to do uh -huh, you got to do it this way or whatever. Well, whatever. It, it all comes down to money. So they're not saying you can't gunsmith for people. They're not saying you can't make new machine guns as a manufacturer. They're not saying you can't thread a muzzle or do whatever. All they're saying is they just want you to kiss the rings. They want your money. That's all it is. It's revenue. So when you look at it from that standpoint, you understand that it's all about revenueing and nothing more. Then you know it, it's not. Sometimes life isn't fair, but it's it's cost of doing business. If you're going to be a gunsmith, it's just one more way for them to try to dole tax dollars out of people and get and to extort you <laughs> for money. And that's the only like thing I can really draw conclusion wise from this program and for the redefining. And, and clarification of this program is it's about money and mm -hmm. they want your money. Well, it's about money and then a lot of people look at it as a control thing. I mean, if if this is the if this thing really comes to fruition and it's really the case, then uh, it could mean that a lot of small like mom and pop gunsmiths and whatnot right. are going to be out of business. And um, you know, larger places might have a monopoly on the industry and or or folks you know who have an old gun and they they can't get it or they they can't afford like a big gunsmith or something like that. They had a buddy down the road who did it. You know, and small local shop. Yeah. It means that their gun's going to be out of commission for a while or whatever the case is, or maybe yeah. forever. So it, 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 it has the it has the flavor of being a purposeful uh, disenfranchisement of certain people. You might live in a rural area where maybe your local mom and pop gunsmith's the only guy you got, and he's mm -hmm. your local gunsmith. 
And what's going to happen when he goes, well, you know, I'm not gunsmithing anymore because all this ITAR crap. And, you know, I just don't want to deal with the headache. I don't want to have to pay the money for one. But two, it just sounds, it sounds like too much for me to mess with. And it just sounds like it's regulated to the point now where I don't think I want to do it anymore. It's almost like a little splinter that you leave untended and it starts to fester, you know. Yeah, I think that's the it is. whole idea. You it know? sure is. So, I mean, um, guys, thank you for watching today's video. Um, I know that these gun gripes, you know, sometimes we have to report bad news and I hate it. Uh, but at the same time, there is kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, we, we make these gun gripes to educate people on things that are going on. I think that being a, uh, a responsible firearms owner is also a well-informed firearms owner, knowing what's going on in the world around you, knowing when you're under attack as a firearms owner, mm -hmm. knowing when there's something that you have to react to uh, to stay on top of your rights. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, is this like a stripping of rights? Are they trying to take rights away? Well, no, not necessarily, but anytime time something comes up that has to do with firearms, it's important to stay on top of it because firearms are one of the most regulated things that there is in the United States. Everything from the manufacturing end all the way down to when you buy guns, it's one of the most heavily regulated industries that there possibly is in the U.S. So in light of that, there's going to be a lot of crap that kind of comes uh, sloshing down the mountain and sometimes you got to dodge it or you're going to get mm -hmm. swept away. So that's the main reason for making these videos. Yep. So. And make sure if you want more detailed information about this, please go check out the Legal Brief. It's an awesome program over on the Gun Collective. Yes. There'll be a link in the description below. Yeah, also check out the uh, NRA's website. Yep. Um, you know, there's the NRA, but then there's like the NRA ILA. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer to get a lot of my information from the ILA side because they're the, the side that's really more responsible for reporting a lot of the legislative uh, uglies that are going on right now. Um, I would certainly recommend going over there and checking it out. Um, you can actually download a um, SS feed, I believe. Um, so like if you want to have like a little widget on your desktop, it'll pop through articles as they, you know, uh, oh, become uh, available. RSS. RSS yeah. feed, yeah. So if you want to do something like that, you can do it. Or like me, I just bookmark the site. Mm -hmm. And then two or three times a week, I just go on there and just refresh it and kind of see what's happening. So yep. that's always a good idea. But uh, Thank you for your time, guys. We appreciate it. And uh, we got many more videos on the way. Uh, stay tuned. Much more gunsmithing, reloading, shooting content. I mean, stuff we're doing, torture tests, meltdowns. I mean, think, at the present time this video is being made, we have like two or three meltdowns planned that haven't even been made yet. So mm -hmm. tons of cool stuff on the way. Make sure you stay tuned for that. Thank you for your time. We'll catch you next time. Later.